dear audience assalamu alaikum and very good day we are happy to be on our sixth day of friday eco 2020 and today is a special day of our eco workshop because we have got uh, with us the father of echocardiography of the world professor nc nanda so uh, having the legend in echocardiography with us will certainly add to the value of the program. Uh, we think that we all will enjoy today's program the most. Today, uh, we have only one scientific session in our program. And as usual, today's uh, program will be chaired by Professor Abdullah Shafi Mojumdar. And we have got two panelists with us today. One is Professor Abdul Rahman. He will join us from the USA. And also we have got Professor Abdul Adud Choudhury. He has already been with us. Uh, today, this program will be moderated by uh, Dr. Mohammadullah Firoz and also me. Uh, we both are associate professors of cardiology. Uh, I think at first we will hear some few words from Professor Abdullah Shafi Mujumdar. And then uh, the life sketch of Professor N.C. Nanda will be presented by Dr. Mohammadullah Firoz. And then we will hear the scientific presentation uh, from the father of echocardiography. And uh, we th think we have a lavish uh, amount of time with us and we will enjoy the whole program to the most. Uh, may I request <laughs> Professor Abdullah to say a few words regarding the program? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Monwar. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it is our uh, great honor and pleasure to have Professor N.C. Nanda uh, among us. And I welcome him to our webinar session. And as you know, he is the founder, uh, president of the International Society of Cardiovascular Ultrasound. And at his inspiration, uh, we started the Bangladesh chapter in 2007. We made a grand program at Dhaka, which he joined at that time. And we also went to Sundarbans on a launch and enjoyed a lot. There is a good memories in the 2007. And since then, the Bangladesh chapter is going to promote the echocardiographic services for the teaching purposes, for the uh, practical purposes. We have made different programs, which include the Eco Dhaka. Eco Dhaka is an annual program which uh, takes place every year. Uh, the last year, it uh, took place at Dhaka in the Hotel Shonakao, and the previous year, it was held in Bogra. So we have got the Eco Dhaka sessions every year since the 2007. And since 2015, we started the Advanced Eco Course. Advanced Eco Course along with the GROP of New Delhi. Dr. Rakesh Gupta joined me uh, to uh, organize this program. And we have made these uh, five sessions uh, for the last five years. And the, with this, and we also published a journal, cardiovascular journal, since 2008. It is a biannual journal, and the uh, patron is Professor N. Sinonda. So we are very old to, to his uh, inspiration, to his encouragement to build up the uh, echocardiographic promotional services in Bangladesh. And I understand that with his initiative, the echocardiography has gained a new momentum in Bangladesh. It is your credit, uh, sir. The Bangladesh has got the new momentum, new encouragement in echocardiographic services. Because uh, before that, uh, we have got the echocardiography services, but not at this height of the, uh, at this height. So we are we very much owe to your uh, encouragement. We, uh, so uh, with these few words, I think we have to go to the uh, uh, part of uh, agenda of the sessions. And I salute you, sir, that uh, you joined with us and make us encouraged to organize this program. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. May I request Professor Abdul Adud Chaudhuri to utter some welcome words before going to the life sketch of Professor Nanda. Uh, good morning, everybody, and assalamu alaikum. It's a real pleasure to uh, see Professor Nanda after some time. Last time, he had a very good session at my institution, Dhaka Medical College, 
I was actually engaged in another exam, so I was not there physically. But my faculties, colleagues, and my students, they have they spoke very highly of this program. They have very good uh, fond memories of that. And today, I do think we are really lucky to have you amongst us. And we'll be waiting for your lecture and to uh, hear from you again and again. And hope that we'll be seeing you in different other programs. This webinar type format, which uh, has flourished during this COVID era, has made sure that uh, we've got enough time. We are not that hurry because everything has slowed down to some extent. Let us make the best out of this desperate situation. Prasananda, we are really grateful to you and we all welcome you. Professor okay. Ensinanda is really the son of the soil of this Indian subcontinent. And he is also our kith and kin. We all feel him very homely when we see him. And now, uh, Dr. Muhammadullah Firoz is going to present before you a brief life sketch of the father of echocardiography, Professor Ensinanda. Dr. Muhammadullah Firoz. Thank you, Dr. Manwar, and good morning, everyone. Uh, professor Navin Sinanda is the Distinguished Professor of Medicine, Heart Station, Echocardiography Laboratories, University of Alabama, and also Director of Echocardiography Laboratory, the Kirkland Clinic, University of Alabama Health Services Foundation. Professor Nanda is the founder and president of International Society of Cardiovascular Ultrasound since 1991. He's also founder of World Congress of Echocardiography and Vascular Ultrasound. He is the editor of in chief of Echocardiography, a journal of cardiovascular ultrasound and allied techniques since 1989. The 2006 Ellis Island Medal of Honor recipient, Professor Nanda, is a nationally and internationally renowned cardiologist and echocardiographer. He is being honored as father of echocardiography in the international arena of echocardiography for his unique contribution to the development of different modalities and techniques in echocardiography. He plays the decisive role of to disseminate the knowledge of echocardiography all over the world. Dr. Nanda has been contributing in the field of echocardiography for the last 50 years. He was all, uh, also among the first to pioneer the use of stress echocardiography in 1980s and the new innovative technique of color Doppler flow mapping his laboratory at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 1984 became the first facility in the USA to put his equipment, put this equipment into clinical use. Professor Nanda will be remembered for the services he has been rendering for the propagation of echocardiography over the decades with special care and sympathy to the developing countries like Bangladesh. He came to Bangladesh on several occasions since 2007 is the author of more than 20 books on echocardiography, which are considered as must read and reference books of echocardiography. Uh, I welcome Professor Novin Sinanda to our webinar session. Thank you, Firoz Bhai. Uh, dear participants. Just one thing add, yes, Dr. Munwar. Yes, sir. In the life sketch, uh, Dr. Firoz omitted one thing that Bangladesh Cardiac Society awarded him the father of echocardiography award in. 2017, the award was uh, handed over by the then Minister of Health and Family Welfare, uh, Government of Bangladesh, to him at the Hotel Shonago session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We are, we are you, honored sir. to uh, honor him. Thank you, sir. Dear participants, we all are eagerly waiting to hear something from Professor Insinanda. So we have one formal presentation from him, and this is not the end. This is actually the beginning. We like to spend uh, more time with him like an adda. And in that adda, after the formal presentation, you can uh, uh, ask him from any of the aspects of echocardiography, from past, present, and even future. So let us enjoy the formal presentation of Professor Insinanda. I think he will be talking on uh, 3D echocardiography today. Professor Insinanda, sir, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those very kind words. Uh, uh, it just looks like I'm among my own extended family uh, because so, I'm so familiar with so many of you here on the uh, that I can see on the video. I know them very well for a long, long time. 
especially Professor Majumdar. Uh, we go a very long way, uh, right, when you form the, uh, you know, Bangladesh chapter of the International Society of Cardiovascular Ultrasound. So I'm really among many pioneers of echocardiography uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, can you all see my slides? Can you see, if you can see my slide? Can you not see yet, my slide? The first, I just have yet, first not slide. yet, sir. Not yet. Okay. Uh, let me see. How can you? Someone get uh, help with that? Yes, share sir, screen. You, you have to share screen. I did. I did this. I did share the screen already. Um, I think I did that. Let me see if I can go back and uh, uh, may have to just escape this. Let's do this. Uh, uh, you see the slides now? I mean, or no? No, sir. Not yet. Not yet. yet. Not yet. Yeah, so let me yeah, let me turn off then. Uh, share. Actually, all this new technology yeah. need a new team. <laughs> team help at me is needed. Also. Sir, uh, there is a uh, screen, share screen in the lower part of the screen. Uh, I can get that here. I'm not getting the lower part. Let me see. Take a minus it and see. Uh, so you first open the presentation and then uh, minimize this and then go to the oh, share screen. Okay, okay. Let's try to minimize it and then... Uh, no, when I minimize, I don't see the screen now, right now. Uh, let's see uh, where we are. share screen you will find in between the chat and the record so in your down panel you will find the green oh i see here it may yes, be yes. it's between the chat and the record there is share screen uh, no this, this is i don't see the share screen here let uh, me do so one then, thing so you, then you, you have to rejoin again if you cannot yeah, see I, the share screen, you have to rejoin again from your. Oh, device. I see. Okay, let me let me do that. Let me join again. Before rejoining, sir, you just open the PowerPoint, and minimize it, and then rejoin. Oh, first open the PowerPoint. Okay, let me do that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so to join again, it says you share something, but that's not what is sharing now. Uh, is the is the button green? There's a green button on the top. It says Zoom meeting, hide notification, block application, web protections, uh, web pro protection settings. Uh, let me. I think I might have to join again. You know, I think that's what it looks like. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think you may join again. Uh, my... Before joining, you have to minimize the uh, your PowerPoint. So par first. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Okay, let, let me find the PowerPoint. Okay. And, uh, Speaker, voice the menu. Screen share the topic. Okay, I'm going to join again now. Okay, I'll open. You have to leave the meeting, then join again. Yeah, I said you are already in another meeting. Do you want to leave and join this meeting? Let me just say yes, you know. Please unmute Professor Nando. Rajiv. Sir, sir. He, he has left the meeting. Yes, sir, but he nah, has he rejoined. Trying. Sir, unmute yourself. Nanda, sir, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nicely. Okay, now I'm trying to find where my slides are, you know. Share screen. <laughs> But I share go to screen. share screen, I guess, right? Yeah, share screen just... and select the PowerPoint then. Uh, the, my, my, yeah, PowerPoints are here. Uh, let's see if I just can. Just you open the PowerPoint, minimize this, and go to the share screen. 
Okay, first I open the PowerPoint, right? Yes, sir. No, yes, sir. No, sir. You just press the share screen and you okay. will see the PowerPoint in a small window within the share screen. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to pick the share screen first, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I did, and then more PowerPoint is. Uh, Can you see the small PowerPoint? Small window. Small uh, window. Yeah, yeah. Here, I see okay. the PowerPoint. Yes, sir. Click on it. Good, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Done. You are now, now successful, okay. sir. Now to uh, go into... And go to the... Top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Full screen mode. Go to the full screen mode, sir. Yeah. Full screen uh, in the lower part, in the lower part of your probably. Uh, in yes, the yes, sir. yes, this one, yes, this one, yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. You got it now, yes, yeah. sir. but oh. not yet. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Can you see? Perfect, yes, sir. Sir. Perfect. yes, can yes, you see sir. the slides now? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, yes. Sir. everything okay. okay, perfect. Okay, great. Well, okay, so what I was going to talk was a little bit about the a history of uh, echocardiography, as you know, it was uh, Adler and Hertz, uh, who in the 50s, you know, um, uh, first were able to echo the uh, M-mode echo, or it was called A-mode echo from the back wall of the heart, and also look at the mitral valve. And then the thing it became, and then it was Effler in Germany, who actually diagnosed the first case of uh, left atrial myxoma, uh, using M-mode echocardiography. And then there was a hiatus of some years till I think uh, people uh, in the United States starting to use ultrasound and echocardiography, including, I think, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, breast cancer, uh, using uh, ultrasound for other body parts. And then Dr. Feigenbaum uh, actually started working on M-mode echocardiography and looking at the left ventricle. And at that time, there were very few laboratories in the United States doing echocardiography and maybe about two or three laboratories. And one of them was our laboratory in the University of Rochester in New York. And uh, at that time, uh, when I joined in uh, uh, that laboratory in 1971, uh, we could uh, only look at the aortic uh, mitral valve and uh, tricuspid valve, and uh, of course, at the left ventricle. But uh, at that time, uh, because there was a special, uh, someone echocardiographer from South Africa who mentioned that we can never echo the pulmonary valve because it is under, lying under the lung. And therefore, there is one valve we cannot do. And that was a big problem at that time because you need to have all the four valves to be able to characterize many of the cardiac conditions. For example, we could not diagnose dextrotransposition of the great vessels in children or infants or newborns unless uh, you could also look at the pulmonic valve. At that time, I had gone to see some autopsies because I was a fellow in cardiology at that time. And uh, talking to the pathologist, it was very clear. He told me that the pulmonary valve was not under the lung completely. Part of it was uh, not under the lung. So you should be able to echo that, and especially if the pulmonary artery is prominent, you should be able to see the pulmonic valve. So it is not something which everyone believed before that, that you can't echo the pulmonary valve, so forget about it. So we went and uh, with Dr. Gremiak, uh, who was actually a radiologist at that time in uh, University of Rochester, New York, and we were able to actually um, image the pulmonary valve in patients who are undergoing cardiac catheterization. And at that time, we were able to prove that is the pulmonary valve by using contrast echocardiography. At that time, we knew that uh, Indosan and Green, which was used to um, look at uh, cardiac output and stroke volumes, because around that time, the swan Gans catheter had come in, and uh, the National Institute of Health actually asked many uh, laboratories, including our uh, uh, institution, to look to do cardiac output, stroke volume and cardiac output using Indosan and Green. And Dr. John in Philadelphia had known that uh, when he was in the cath lab and someone injected Indosan and Green and they were doing an echocardiogram, you could see the whole cavity you know, light up you know, with, uh, with contrast bubbles, with contrast. We didn't know it was bubbles at that time. So we used the same technique of Indosan and Green and were able to find the pulmonic valve. And that's how pediatric echocardiography got a big stimulus at that time and developed 
very much further up pediatric echocardiography. And at that time, actually, at that time, both there was no separate uh, pediatric and adult echocardiography. We were doing both pediatric and adult. So I was called many times a night uh, with cyanotic uh, newborns to rule out or rule in transposition, dextrotransposition great vessels. Because if you found the dextrotransposition great vessel by Modaco, then of course they would go and enlarge the atrial septum uh, so that there's a little bit of mixing, good mixing of uh, flow from both the atria. And, uh, and of course, uh, then when the, uh, later on, uh, they could do the mustard procedure. So many of the things were very close to us. For example, mustard was in Toronto. I was in Rochester doing echocardiograms, dextrotransposition. There was a Dr. Subramaniam who pioneered actually the um, development of uh, heart pump, you know, I mean, uh, heart pump actually in infants. And so they, he could do some of the operations on these patients. And someone in Albany, which was also again near Rochester, wrote a book actually on uh, transpositional great vessels. So this was all within a radius of about uh, 50 or 100, 150 kilometers uh, around, which is a small, uh, you know, not very, very close by in the United States. So that's how we developed this uh, pulmonary valve. Now, since we talked about the pulmonary valve, I wanted to show you something here. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, of the, the valve, pulmonary valve echo, which we did at that time. So here is the AMOD echo of the pulmonary valve here. And uh, then what we did was, while we were there, the catheter was in the, in the right ventricular outflow tract. So contrast was ejected, and you could see the contrast in the uh, right ventricular outflow tract, as well as it filled the pulmonary valve. So that's how we could validate that what we are doing was actually the pulmonary valve because it looked very much very close to the aortic valve by mode echo at that time. And someone in England actually criticized, saying that you are not echoing the pulmonary valve, you are look, looking at the aortic valve. So that's how this validation became very important. But the question was which cusp of the pulmonary valve we were imaging. We had no idea which, there are three cusps of the pulmonary valve, as you know. And um, uh, here, for example, this is a chair from Gray's Anatomy. So the pulmonary valve has three cusps. Many times asked uh, anyone, name the three cusps of the pulmonary valve, and most of the people would not know that. Our fellows can never tell me what, what, how the cusps are named. But you have an anterior cusp, and then you have a right cusp here, which is to the right side here. You can see that's the aortic valve here, and this is the left cusp of the pulmonary valve. So the question was, which cusp of the pulmonary valve were echoing? And now this was in 1971 when we found the pulmonic valve. Now we were able to check and see which cusp we were echoing when we were doing a 2D echo or MOD echo, it took a long time. It wasn't until 2019, 1971 and 2019. That's almost 50 years, 48, 48 years later that we were able to actually get an idea which cusp of the pulmonary valve we are echoing when we do actually a 2D echo examination. So here is, for example, so what we did with patients uh, in whom we could see three um, uh, two cusps of the pulmonic valve and we acquired data in three-dimensional echocardiography. And when we did that, uh, you, you can see on that this is the top, and we can see the three cusps very well. If you see three cusps, very easy to identify. There's the anterior cusp, there's the left cusp of the pulmonic valve, and there's the right cusp of the pulmonic valve, and here, here we have the aorta here, and that's the left ventricle. So what we then did was to pass a cursor using 3D echo. Uh, from, for example, we passed a cursor from the anterior leaflet, the left leaflet here, and try to see how it looked on the 2D echocardiogram. So once you take a section on the 3D echo, this, this cursor is like a section on 3D echocardiogram. Once you did that particular section, we saw that when you had the, uh, what we are looking at, the, the left cusp of the pulmonary, obviously, because we are passing the cursor, the left cusp and anterior cusp. So here is the anterior cusp, and here is the left cusp of the pulmonary valve, and this is the pulmonary artery. And what we see next to that is really the left ventricle or the mitral valve. This patient is a mitral prosthesis. So we have mitral valve and left ventricle, and then we are imaging the left cusp. Then we thought, let us take a section from the anterior leaflet and the right cusp for the pulmonic valve. When we did that, we got this section here. What we saw was that uh, when you had the right cusp, usually you're echoing the aortic root, and this is the anterior cusp. So most of the time on the 2D echo, we don't see all three leaflets of the pulmonic valve in adults. Maybe in pediatric patients, you may see some of them, but not in adults. And when you see two leaflets, if you are echoing the mitral valve or the left ventricle, then you are echoing the left cusp of the pulmonic valve. But if you are echoing the aortic valve, then most likely you are echoing the right cusp. Now, this is not 100%. depends on rotation, some other abnormalities of the heart. But to, in general, this is what it is. So in other words, which cusp we are looking at depends actually the location 
and also makes it very difficult to really identify all the time which cusp of the polymeric value you're using and 3D echo becomes very, very important. And if you are able to get two liters of polymeric value and take that, uh, grab that into three-dimensional echo, you can really check and see which cusp of the polymeric valve we are looking. And these are the forgotten valves. So now looking at the cusp becomes more important uh, because these are forgotten valves and we are studying more and more this harmonic valve. And more recently, we are also paying attention uh, to the tricuspid valve. So there's also one other way. We also took a section between the right cusp and the left cusp of the pulmonic valve. And what we see, we can see this is the right cusp here, and uh, it's just hidden up on the top, right cusp here and the left cusp. But here you are mainly, you're very much higher up. So you're very much higher up in the, in the ventricle. You're almost near the septum here. So that's when you can get the two cusps. So depending upon how you're taking the section and what image, uh, what structures you are getting, you may be able to image and not the anterior cusp, but on the right cusp, actually, which becomes the anterior structure here. And we can look at the cusp. So this particular advance in echocardiography took place just to show you that some of the advances take a very long time, like this one took a very long time, almost 48 years for us to figure out what we are, which, which cusp we are looking at. But some of the advances, which I'll show later on, are very, very quick. Uh, quick. I mean, they've been uh, done in a very, uh, very fast, uh, maybe in a, a period of some years only. Here, just to show you uh, 2D echo. Uh, so we are seeing two leaflets. So now I can I, I, now I'm getting the left ventricle mitral valve. So I know this will most likely be the anterior cusp, and this is going to be the left cusp of the pulmonic valve. And here, for example, I'm getting the aorta here, and uh, here is the right ventricular outflow tract, pulmonary artery, both branches. So here I'm going to echo most likely the anterior cusp, and on the other side I'm going to echo the right cusp of the pulmonic valve. So different cusps of the pulmonic valve are echoed, are imaged depending upon the location of nearby structures. And again, this can vary when there is some abnormalities of these, uh, of these structures or the, the heart is enlarged and uh, it could, could vary also. So just to give you an idea about the advantage of uh, 3D echocardiography. And here is uh, another picture from, I think this is um, from one of the atlases here. And, uh, and you, here again, you can see, that if you look at the, uh, the right cusp, this one here, a little bit higher up and the left cusp a little bit lower down. So it makes more sense that the left cusp is in relation to the ventricle and mitral valve and the right cusp is, is in relation to the aorta. So just to give you some sort of an idea how when advances occur, they can take a very long time or they can take, uh, they can be very, very fast. Another advance which has occurred and uh, I think um, we have done that a bit in our own laboratory is to go and the patient in the right lateral decubitus, right lateral, not left lateral, right lateral decubitus, and try to look at the SVC and the aorta. So here, for example, in this particular patient, we can see the SVC very clearly. Here is the crystal terminalis. Uh, there is a little bit of pericardial effusion here. This is the right atrial appendage here, right atrium. And here we are getting the eustachian valve, chronic sinus here, and this is the inferior vena cava, and you can see the atrial septum very clearly here. So this is a very good view, for example, to look at the sinus venosus atrial septal defect relating to the SVC very clear here because you can see the junction very clearly here, much clearly than you can see on the apical four chamber view in an adult because of the dropouts where you can misdiagnose an ASD when no ASD is present. And also you can see the SVC. The SVC becomes very important also because some patients, uh, when we look at the flow status of the patient or the right atrial pressure, uh, non-invasively, and there are bandages and there's some abdominal operation. So you cannot really image the uh, IVC, but then in those cases, the SVC becomes very, very important. And it will do the same thing when you look at the collapsibility of the SVC and IVC, uh, indicating and when the size is normal, that the pressures are low, or if they're very, very small, you know, there is a hypovolemia. If they're large and non-dilated, as we all know, that would mean that the pressures are quite high in the right atrium. So this becomes uh, also very useful, this right uh, side. Uh, not only that, uh, here again, we grabbed it in three dimensions. So three dimensions is very good because when you do a two dimensional echo, you don't see the right atrial appendage very well. Right atrial appendage actually, as we all know, from congenital heart disease, have more, more trabeculations than the left atrial appendage. But actually, if you go, now if you crop this so that you can cut this, this three dimensional section, if you section it, then what we see, I saw this uh, SVC is in short axis here. Uh, aorta is there also, and now you can see many uh, tuberculations 
in the right atrial appendage. Now, these are not very well seen, even on the using the transesophageal like echocardiography many times, uh, but using the right atrial, uh, right parasternal view, you can see this. Now, you can't see them in every patient, depends on the window, of, of course, but in about 60, 70% of the patients, uh, you can do a good examination from the right parasternal Has The patient has to be in the right lateral decubitus, and you have to be very close to the uh, sternum. And I think I demonstrated some of this uh, during my, in, in the echo, Dhaka, when I'd gone to the you know, medical college at that time. And there are some prominent trabeculations, right lateral appendage called tenia saginata, and sometimes there are two or three of these. So these are called as tenia saginata. And not only that, one can also look at the cristal terminalis very well uh, and, and its branches. And you know the cristal terminalis is a uh, site of uh, many of the atrial arrhythmias. So one can see this uh, cristal terminalis also quite well using this approach. Not only that, the advantage of 3D echo, since I'm like going to focus a little bit on 3D echo here, whenever we measure any structure, for example, here you're looking at the right appendage, you can measure the size of the appendage or the size of vegetation or tumor, but that's only giving you some dimensions. What is more important is to look at the volume. So you can look at the volume of the vegetation, volume of uh, right atrial appendage here. And this you can do very well 3D echocardiography here, for example, the volume in the right atrial appendage in this particular patient flowed out to be 20 cc's and that again you can do 20 mils and this again you can do uh, using uh, three-dimensional echocardiography. <laughs> we also found a very interesting thing. When we looked at the right atrial appendage, um, when we looked at the right parasol approach, when you actually, we can examine a longer length of the ascending aorta many times than when you can do with the left parasol approach, even though you move your transducer higher up or more near the sternum and higher up. But when you go for the right atrial appendage, the, the size of the ascending aorta we get in adults is much larger than you will actually get from the left parasol approach. Not only that, when you examine the aorta from the left parasol approach, the structure you see behind the aorta uh, is most likely the superior vena cava in 90% of the patients. 90% of the patient. But when you examine it in the right atrial appendage, you, you, most of the time you get a plane in such a way that the structure you get behind the ascending aorta is right for me. If you look at Dr. Otto's book, she will always say this is the right pulmonary artery behind the aorta from the, parasol, from the left parasol approach. Uh, but when we actually uh, did a uh, uh, study in our patient, many of the patients we found, most of the time from the left parasol approach, you get the superior vena cava behind the aorta. But when you do the right uh, parasol approach, you get the pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery behind. Now, what is the importance of this? If you are measuring the mid-ascending aortic diameter, and many times we measure that on the CT scan, uh, CT scan actually, or MRI, when you do that, they use the right pulmonary artery as the guide point. They use this as a marker. So when you see, they see the right pulmonary artery, they, they'll measure the, uh, the uh, width of the aorta at this particular point. So that's where they can give you the, the width of the ascending aorta. So if you want to correlate your echo finding with something different like CT scan or MRI and be as accurate or uh, having the same reference point, then if you do it from the left parasol approach, you would not be very accurate because you are not you, don't, you do not have the right permeability in most patients, you have the SVC. But if you are examining that from the right parasol approach, and mostly all the time you are going to get the right permeability and therefore this particular dimension shown in blue here would correlate much better the CT scan. So this is another advantage of doing the right person approach. You can get the mid-ascending aortic diameter, which is very similar, corresponds to what you can get on the CT scan or magnetic resonance imaging. Of course, this will show you when you do 3D echo, it's also very easy to get a short axis view, which you cannot go very easily on the 2D echo here. You can short axis view. And when you get the short axis view, this is the, this is the view one uses try to calculate the stiffness of the aorta. Aortic stiffness, if you want to calculate, uh, you also need a short axis view. And 3D echo becomes very useful. And that too, from the right parasol approach shown here, uh, uh, this is the aortic valve and this is the ascending aorta from the right parasol view. So this is uh, one thing I just wanted to show you some of the newer, newer advances. There, I mean, some of them are old things, but uh, we have a new, I mean, a little bit advanced there. So we are doing it more carefully. We are we got better transducers than what we had many years ago. So right personal approach becomes more easy to do now in adults, not pediatric patients, different, but adults, than we can in uh, than we could many years ago. 
the other major advance, of course, has come in looking at the point of care cardiac ultrasound. So you can take these small handle machines, uh, which you can put in a white coat pocket, and or maybe the size of a laptop, and can make a very quick diagnosis of uh, life-threatening emergencies. For example, you can quickly diagnose cardiac tamponade, poor LV function, aortic dissection, and you can take this anywhere in the CCO, in the emergency room, and also you can take this, of course, uh, in the rural areas, also very easy, convenient to take them and make a very good diagnosis. And uh, not only that, but this also has, uh, we have now helped because previously only the cardiologists used to do the echocardiograms, but now emergency physicians are doing it. The other day I had a gastroenterologist come to me and say, oh, show me, teach me how to do actually uh, an echocardiogram using these small machines. And of course, it's going to take much more time teach a gastroenterologist than someone uh, in the, so an intensivist or someone in the emergency room. So this is show you one of the small handle machine here and others are just simply something like actually just uh, like a laptop to which a translucent is attached and you can store these images on a cloud or anytime just like because it's on, on your laptop here and you can store these images also very well. And what has happened is now this is not for some time. But what is the new thing that has come up is something which we call as butterfly ultrasound, butterfly focus, butterfly point of care cardiac ultrasound. So here, now when we use ultrasound, we are using piezoelectric crystals. These, these are the crystals when you stimulate them by electricity, they produce ultrasound, ultrasonic waves. But there is a, nowadays, people have started using a computer chip based technology, not, not piezoelectric crystals, but computer chip based technology. And by doing this, they can get a small point of care ultrasound, it's practically a translucent attached to a laptop, something like that. And uh, the thing is, the same translucent can be used for not only cardiac examination, but also for abdominal examination, as well as peripheral examination, for example, the carotid examination. So you don't have to change the translucent. If you have to do abdominal ultrasound, many times you have to change the probe because you don't get good pictures. And if you're doing carotid, you have to change probe again. Uh, to get the carotids, but here with this one, same transducer can be used for every examination. Even more important, the cost is much lower. The cost is almost one fifth or so, or depending upon you know uh, who the uh, provider is in your in your country or in your city, uh, but much lower cost. So now this point of care ultrasound, the, the advance has happened. You get a much lower cost, and you can use the same transducer for many types of uh, not only cardiac exam, but uh, other bodily parts can be examined with the same transducer. The other thing, of course, another advantage and uh, uh, thing has come up is looking at 3D echo volumes. We know 3D echo volumes are more accurate than 2D echo volumes because you've got the whole, practically the whole ventricle in your hand, in, in, in your data set here, and you can get the volumes much better. But then again, it was very laborious process because you had to trace the endocardium everywhere um, into three many views here, so it took a long time. So it's not very popular to do 3D echo uh, volume, although we know or 3D, not only you can get 3D echo volumes and diastolic and systolic, as well as cardiac output, stroke volume, et cetera. But one, I'm looking at dyssynchrony also, but uh, what it was to use artificial intelligence. So they fed uh, many, maybe 2,000, 3,000 very well animatorized ventricles to the computer, and then using artificial intelligence, they could automatically plot your ventricle. Not only that, if uh, there was a dropout here, it will go out and try to find the apex and calculate very accurate volumes. Now, this is not perfect yet. We still have some problems, especially the ventricle, the core window. We don't get the uh, most reliable from uh, artificial intelligence, but it is, so there are some wrinkles there. There are a little, some problems there, but it is the, on the way to becoming something where we get automatic ejection fraction and automatic uh, volumes of the left ventricle, uh, very accurate in uh, three using three-dimensional uh, echocardiography together with artificial intelligence. So here you can get the volume of the left ventricle. The advantage is because you are also looking at diastolic function, you can also get the uh, volume of the left atrium here. And these give you all the, different. you can read them, but they're all volumes and stroke volume ejection fracture, et cetera, et cetera uh, can be given automatically and very quickly. That's important because you don't have much time. You want to spend 
as little time and get as much information with as little time. So this becomes a very, very useful 3D cartography, the artificial intelligence. Not only that, you can look at the volume, volumes of individual, uh, individual actually uh, segments and get an idea of the dyssynchrony also very well, uh, which can be useful for a CRT, uh, which becomes very important to look at the dyssynchrony also. And of course, right ventricle is such a complicated shape, has a very complicated shape. It's very difficult to measure its volumes by 2D echocardiography. But when you go for 3D echocardiography, it can be done very easily. We'll talk a little bit about strain, 3D strain later on. You can also quantify strain uh, using 3D echocardiography, both for the left ventricle as well as uh, for the right ventricle. So this is another advance. So we are going into strain now here. As we know, the the ventricle is not only uh, not only actually um, uh, moves inwards, we call the radial strain, but then there's also a circ it also moves circumferentially, uh, which we call the circumferential strain. But the uh, important thing which has happened is that the base of the ventricle will move towards the apex. The apex is relatively constant to the movement. The base moves towards the apex, so we get the global we can get the longitudinal strain, and if you take the longitudinal strain from various segments, uh, maximum, uh, maximum from various segments and average it, so you get the maximum, average maximum global longitudinal strain of the left ventricle that has shown to be very useful because it is looking not on the inward motion where you calculate the ejection fraction, but looking at the longitudinal motion, longitudinal motion, the base is going towards the apex, and that is a different uh, portion of the ventricle you are looking at, uh, and the, the looking at, and many times that decreases before the ejection fraction decreases. So you can pick up subclinical cardiac uh, disease. Not only they're very useful in cancer patients because in cancer patients, uh, some of the drugs they give are cardiotoxic, and by the time the ejection fraction goes down, sometimes the LV uh, function decrease in LV function becomes irreversible. So therefore, the strain becomes very important. Once the strain decreases. You can modify the drug or uh, stop the drug or change your uh, drug regimen for some of the cancer patients. And that becomes uh, very, very useful because uh, you can pick it up very early before the ejection fraction goes down. So you avoid some irreversible damage to the ventricle. So this, of course, strain becomes another very important global longitudinal strain. Uh, when you do a three-dimensional uh, uh, strain, you are also get, you're also getting actually, we call area strain, which is a combination of longitudinal strain where the base is moving toward the apex and also circumferential strain where the, you're looking at the circumference change in the circumference of the left ventricle and that has been found to be also useful uh, in many uh, clinical situations. So just to give you some idea about uh, this. Now, what is the difference between 2D tracking and 3D tracking? Well, what when we do speckle tracking, we used to do uh, tissue Doppler, we still do tissue Doppler imaging, but not so much as we do now speckle tracking because tissue Doppler imaging was based on Doppler, uh, which actually, as you know, you have to be per parallel to the motion of a structure to get a Doppler, to get the Doppler velocity accurately, and the heart is moving, so it becomes difficult with tissue Doppler imaging. But the speckle tracking is 2D echo based, so you don't have that problem. Um, and so what we are looking at is a small group of um, cells, you can say we call it speckles in the myocardium, and then the uh, same speckles throughout the cardiac cycle. So that's speckle tracking echocardiography. That's how you can look at the motion of the base of the ventricle towards the apex. But the problem is because when you do a 2D echo, the slice is very thin. So the chances of these speckles moving out of the plane are very high, much higher, uh, much higher. So therefore, we are not really looking at the same speckle. So 2D speckle tracking echocardiography may not be that very accurate. But if you go for three-dimensional echocardiography, you are getting a pyramidal data set, and the chances of this speckle, as, you, as the computer follows it or the machine follows it in the cardiac cycle, and out of this three-dimensional, big three-dimensional data set is much less than very thin, razor-thin slice using two-dimensional echocardiography. So I think more and more we are thinking now we should go into this 3D speckle tracking echocardiography because uh, the, the, it's going to be more accurate than 2D speckle tracking echocardiography. So the problem here is that uh, when you go for three-dimensional echocardiography, uh, we are looking at the third dimension, but the heart is moving. So when we call it three-dimensional echocardiography, we are really looking also in incorporating the time element. So in uh, incorporating a fourth dimension, 
So once we are having a four dimension, we are calling it a four dimensional, we should really call it four dimensional echocardiography, not three dimensional echocardiography, we should call it four dimensional speckle tracking echocardiography. But we, by convention, we are calling three dimensional echocardiography. At one point when 3D echo was being developed, uh, and we used to call four dimensional echocardiography, even now we call it 3D echocardiography, when we mean 4D echocardiography, one machine, one equipment manufacturer came with a very clever idea. They said, everybody does 3D echo, but our machine does 4D echo. So many people bought that machine. Oh, this is 4D echo. Everything else is doing 3D echo. It's the same thing. But that was a good selling point. Uh, but of course, people very quickly came to know it's the same. They're doing the same thing. Uh, but at least it was, they tried to do, sell it, uh, their machine, saying it's a little bit different than other machines. And of course, as I've mentioned many times, and I'm in Bangladesh also, that uh, someone once asked me a question, uh, we are doing 3D and 4D echocardiography. Is there something like a five-dimensional echocardiography? And I had to think a little bit. And I thought, I said, well, maybe there's a spiritual dimension, but we'll probably do that five-dimensional echo in future. We'll in, in, we use the spiritual dimension also. But right now, we, can, we are only happy with the of 3D and 4D echocardiography. So here is to the advantage of 3D speckle tracking echocardiography is more accurate in following the same speckle frame to frame, provides calculation of area strain, which is a combination of longitudinal and circumferential strain, useful in many situations. But of course, uh, now it's available in many systems. Previously, it was not available in many systems, needed more further validation also. I think these two are uh, now getting more and more systems are getting this uh, 4D uh, or 3D or 4D, you want to call it, speckle tracking echocardiography. What other advances have come in? Well, another advance has come in now. Many in the United States, practically every other patient, we use contrast echocardiography because we are not able to see the endocardium of the left ventricle very well. And many times when we try to calculate the function, we make a mistake because we are looking at the epicardium which contracts, uh, which moves much less than the endocardium. We don't see the endocardium very well, as you can see here. We don't see the endocardium in this region. So we use contrast echocardiography a lot. As you know, they are small microbubbles, which you inject, which are, uh, which are gas bubbles. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then those gas bubbles are coated many times with a lipid around it to make it stable, so that when you inject them intravenously, they will cross the pulmonary circulation and go, go into the right heart, Cross the pulmonary circulation, go into the and left ventricle, and actually can opacify the left ventricle and the left atrium. So basically, you get a left ventricular angiogram, you get a uh, left atrial angiogram also, and left ventricular angiogram, left atrial angiogram. They go into the muscles, and you can look at the perfusion of the myocardium also with contrast echocardiography. Not very perfusion, not very much used in the United States, but in other Europe it is used quite a lot, and. Uh, when it comes to opacification of the left ventricle endocardium, uh, that is very uh, that we do all the time uh, in in our laboratory. But the contrast is expensive; it's not cheap. So what has happened is now we have got uh, another thing introduced, which is use color power Doppler mode. <laughs> we used this quite a while ago, where you are looking at the amp. I won't go into all the principles, but you are looking at the amplitude of the power of the Doppler signal, and you are looking at the difference in the intensity of the luminance of the power Doppler signals. So basically, you are making the, we, we can use color Doppler, but it never actually fills up the whole ventricle. When you go into this color power mode, like I can show the next, uh, maybe in the next one here. Oh, I don't have that, but sorry. I, but uh, let me show, maybe it is here actually, it's um, hidden by, can you see the slide? Or I, I, I can't see the slide because I'm hidden by this, but if you see this, you'll see that the whole of the left ventricle is actually filled with the, uh, uh, with the color flow mapping, color flow. So now instead of using contrast echocardiography, you can actually use this uh, uh, blood flow imaging and you can fill up the whole ventricle and you can get assessment of the ventricular fraction much better and much cheaper, of course, than using contrast echocardiography because part of the machine. Now only one equipment has it has this uh, particular, um, uh, you know, particular application. But I think in future, many other uh, uh, machines uh, many of the equipment will have the same application. So this is something, I think, a big advance. And this has been, uh, the studies have been done by Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Ahmad, uh, Masood Ahmad, in, uh, a friend of mine in Galveston, uh, in uh, Texas. He did the first studies uh, using this. Now, the other advance which has come up in is uh, looking at vortex. Now, let me show you the picture of a vortex here. You can see uh, these are the eddy currents, like you can see the blood is moving in a sort of a circular motion. 
So what we always thought in the beginning was blood will flow from the left atrium into the ventricle in a linear manner. And from the left ventricle, it will go into the aorta in a linear manner again. But that's not true. When we image this vortex formation again using color Doppler, uh, we find what happens is the blood is actually moving in, uh, in eddies. It's moving in a sort of a circular fashion. And why it is moving in a circular fashion? Because God has made it in such a way that when it moves in a circular fashion, the energy loss is much less. When the blood is moving from the left atrium into the left ventricle, the ventricle contracts and that goes into the aorta. If it is laminar, you lose much more energy. But if it flows in a circular motion, kind of, you know, an eddy is like eddy currents in a circular motion, then you have less energy lost. So that is very important. Now, how we use how people have used it, they've used it to look actually at the uh, diastolic dysfunction. Obviously, you can, so you can calculate the energy, energy loss uh, in a normal ventricle in diastole. And if, if you find the energy loss is much more, then that means there must be diastolic dysfunction. Otherwise, the energy loss would, if there is no diastolic dysfunction, if the diastolic dysfunction is normal in diastole, uh, you would not be using that much energy loss. But there's more energy loss when the diastolic dysfunction. So one can calculate this diastolic dysfunction. A very good, another way to do diastolic dysfunction is to do this is a vortex imaging also. So this is another advance in uh, echocardiography that has happened. So here it is, the energy loss, uh, EL, can quali quantitatively evaluate the LV diastolic function in blood flow fluid dynamics. So this is actually a new diameter, new parameter, which one can use to assess the astrolic function. Now let's go back to contrast echo. So contrast echo is costly, but it has some other advantage also. The newer uses, you can drug delivery, because as you know, when you inject contrast and you are using uh, normal, uh, you're used to taking the ultrasound with the normal power levels, not which you use for diagnostic purposes, it also destroys these micro bubbles. So many times, if you want to keep the contrast longer to look at myocardial perfusion or to look at uh, the ventricle also, you decrease the power of the ultrasound machine, which you can do very easily. We call it mechanical index. You reduce it. And then the contrast is for a longer time. And the destruction takes longer for the contrast to get destroyed. So that is what we use. But what you can do is you can actually inject a drug or you can take a gene and you can put it in the contrast and then the contrast will go. And supposing you want to destroy this gene, uh, deliver the gene in part of the myocardium. So at that point, you can suddenly increase the, just turn the knob up and you increase the power level and you destroy the contrast. So the gene, uh, the contrast balls are destroyed. So the gene and drug uh, drugs will be liberated at that particular area. So you can look in a particular locality of the myocardium or brain or anywhere you want to do in the body. Uh, you can actually turn the power down so the genes are uh, the contrast balls are stable. Then when you go in a particular part of the myocardium, you turn the machine, uh, turn the uh, knob on, make it normal power from very low power, and the contrast, the genes will be liberated because the bubbles will be destroyed. The contrast bubbles. So that is one uh, advantage of a new, a new. But this is still experimental. It hasn't been used much clinically, but it's a very good, very good promise of them. It is a very good promise. The other thing, of course, is that, as I mentioned, that the, the actually what happens is that a normal ultrasonic wave can actually destroy micro bubbles. It has, we also know that the ultrasound can also uh, destroy the thrombus, it can destroy thrombus anywhere. For example, it can destroy thrombus in the coronary microcirculation. If it destroys the coronary microcirculation thrombi, then you can improve the blood flow. So what they've done is they what they changed the transducer a little bit. For example, here is uh, here is a coronary artery where you have thrombi. So when you do a PTCA, for example, you are destroying, uh, you are actually enlarging the vessel wall in the macro circulation in the larger coronary arteries. But when you go into the micro circulation, you're doing nothing. You are not doing. There no angioplasty done in the micro circulation. So many times after angioplasty. The blood flow does not improve. The TME blood flow does not improve very much. Actually, they say in about 50% of the patients, according to one study, there may not be complete improvement in the blood flow. Only part of that uh, improved. So what you can do then? You can, when you do the angioplasty, at the same time, use a transducer, modify that. So the pulses are very, I mean, the duration of the pulse is very small. When you make the duration of the pulse is very small, it tends to destroy the thrombi more. More thrombi are destroyed. So what you do when you do the angioplasty, you place your transducer only for a few minutes, four or five minutes, 
And what happens? You destroy the thrombi in the microcirculation. So you improve the blood flow much more than you would improve only by doing a PTCA, only by doing an angioplasty. Let me look at the next slide. <clears throat> For example, here is pre thrombolysis. Before, they did a PTCA in this patient, and we injected contrast, and of course, the contrast is going to fill the left ventricle. You can see the endocardial border very well here. But at the same time, uh, it fills up this part of the septum very well. But if you look at the apex shown by these black arrows, this part of the myocardium is not filled with contrast at all. Okay. So why didn't fill up with contrast even do angioplasty? Because the microcirculation, the small, very small coronary arteries have thrombi in it. So then you do the thrombolysis only a few minutes of a special transducer, specially modulated, modified transducer. And what happens? Suddenly everything is filled up. This area, which was very dark here, no blood flow, now has a lot of blood flow here. So it is completely filled up. So therefore, this has been, this is something which has been picking up very quickly. This was started in Brazil by Dr. Matthias, who, was, by the way, he ran a very good World Congress of Echocardiography for us and was the president at that time. <clears throat> so Dr. Matthias actually did this work and showed that this, if you use the transfers at the same time, it helps a lot. Now, you don't use the same transducer. You have to use actually a, a, a low energy ultrasound and a very, very fast, uh, very uh, rapid pulsation. So to modify a, pro a, pro a probe, once the probe is modified, then you can use it for sonothrombolysis. We're already using it now clinically. Everyone practically in the, most of the laboratories in the in USA, Catholics are using it to dissolve pulmonary thrombi. In patients with pulmonary embolism, you can destroy the pulmonary thrombi. But this uh, here, what happens is, that you are putting a catheter in the pulmonary artery near the thrombus and you are shooting uh, the dissolving substance. You are shooting the thrombolytic agents. So it will dissolve the thrombus. But if you put another catheter with a, thr with a small pro probe, with a small ultrasonic probe at the tip of the probe and use it at the same time into the pulmonary artery, then the thrombus resolution is faster and more complete. So, because if you take longer time when you, and you're, and also you are using less amount of thrombolytic therapy. When you use more amount of thrombolytic therapy, the chance of bleeding go up, uh, go up, goes up very high, go up very high. So here you are using actually, um, uh, you're using actually uh, less uh, uh, dose of the thrombolytic agent and at the same time, faster uh, dissolving of thrombus. So this is now being done routinely. We're using ultrasound at the tip of a catheter, a small transducer, during thrombolysis uh, for, uh, for pulmonary embolism. So that is another very important use of ultrasound. It's another advance in ultrasound. Last thing, or one of the last thing I want to do, one of the two last things I want to talk about is Doppler vibrometry. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, we used to have the Doppler vibrometry before. Uh, now, let me ask you one question, and I, I don't know, I get a good answer to that. How many of you have heard a murmur from coronary stenosis? <clears throat> we are very good, as you know, in uh, India and Bangladesh and Southeast Asia. We pride ourselves on being clinically very good. Um, not too many people have heard a murmur of coronary stenosis. We know that when there is uh, by Doppler, like we, we have shown in our own studies, when we have done a Doppler uh, in patients with uh, severe stenosis, the velocity is very high, like three or four meters per second, something like moderate or severe aortic stenosis. Now, if you can hear, hear a murmur from aortic stenosis, you should be able to hear a murmur from severe coronary stenosis also. But, and we thought impossible, but actually if you look in the literature, it's been reported many, many years ago that coronary stenosis can produce a murmur. But anyhow, it's not very easy. I don't think, I've never heard a murmur from coronary stenosis. <coughs> and I, I think many of us haven't heard. <coughs> but I know some people might have heard. So using the same principle here, Doppler, ultimately what is Doppler? Doppler is an internal stethoscope. It's an internal stethoscope. You hear when you put the stethoscope on the chest wall, it's external, but when you go inside, Doppler or velocity you are looking at, you get the noise also, as you know, you get the sound from aortic stenosis, internal stethoscope. So what they've developed, they've developed a Doppler transduce in such a manner that uh, uh, they put it in a normal coronary artery. Here is the right coronary artery, which is normal, no stenosis at all. And in diastole, of course, <clears throat> the flow signals are in diastole, as you know. In diastole, you see a very small velocity here small. But if you put this in a patient with severe stenosis, like here, this severe stenosis, right coronary artery, the operative signals become large. So what one can do is to take uh, a probe and go for the four-chamber, two-chamber views, other views, and keep on placing a Doppler symbol at various places, 
and you can tell where there is coronary, severe coronary stenosis, depending upon where you get this high blood flow in diastole, that means there is more severe coronary stenosis. So this is very interesting. So in other words, you can actually go in, uh, do an echo, place your Doppler, this particular, this particular Doppler with modification, and, and pick up areas of stenosis. So that is another important us uh, advance in the coronary circulation. It used to be that we call is called now wide range, uh, cardiac acquisition, focused imaging, flash imaging. It has been there for many years, but now it has been improved so that it is more perfect. Here it says it is more perfect now. Uh, it is actually what it is: reflected ultrasound pulses is phase modulated by, with vibration, and therefore you can hear this vibration. You can put in the short axis view. You can look at different parts of the ventricle, different parts of the septum try to get where there is more severe stenosis. I think this is something very, very dramatic and something which will, but it's still uh, under investigation in the sense that people have shown it, but I think more people have to use it and see and validate it that completely. So some of these, what I'm showing you are some things which are work in progress, uh, where there's a lot of promise, uh, not yet used completely clinically. Some other things I've shown, of course, are being used all the time, use it uh, clinically. Uh, we are also having cardiac elastography, which tells you how stiff uh, any structure is, like how stiff liver is, had been used uh, by in um, ultrasound quite a bit to look at liver stiffness. For example, there is fat infiltration of liver and other, other, other liver pathologies. But now they're also using it uh, clinically for heart. Uh, for example, here, the Mayo Clinic people have used it here, published again very recently in 2019, last year. And they've shown that if you use this uh, uh, elastography, they are looking at the intrinsic velocity propagation of myocardial stretch, how much the myocardium is stretching and how stiff it is. Normal will have a small value, like 1.7 meter per second. But if you have between the amyloid doses, where the ventricle will be stiff, uh, it's actually very high. So therefore, this can help in diagnosis of some infiltrative cardiac diseases, like a cardiac amyloid doses. So I'm, I've given you some ideas about uh, some of the advantages, uh, some of the uh, ad advances which have already occurred and we are using it clinically, and some other people are using it clinically, and some other things which are still, some people have used it, but hasn't, it's going to take some time before everybody is going to use, for example, Doppler vibrometry, elastography will take some more time for it to be uh, used clinically. This is actually a, a sort of a true view, it's a three-dimensional echo, but you kind of, uh, we call it a true view, because what you do is practically look at a 3D echo, and something like we shine a torch on it, so it becomes very bright and very clear. So here, for example, is actually a watchman device, uh, which is the surgical specimen looks like this. And you can see it with a 3D uh, echo here, 3D TE echo, looks very similar to the surgical specimen. So again, show you some more advances in 3D echocardiography here. I will not go into training except to show you something about 3D printing. A lot of it is being done by CT, but also with the uh, three-dimensional echocardiography. You can look at 3D printing. Um, for example, you can look at this VSD. Uh, you can teach, uh, surgeons can teach their associates uh, uh, how to close it and to how to avoid any structures. For example, there may be conduction uh, uh, branches here which you don't want to damage and uh, how to do that. Plus, you can show this to a patient. And this, see, these materials were very expensive. Now, these materials are becoming cheaper also. Uh, so this 3D printing is another thing uh, which may be taking off. And just to uh, show you close off here, show you a baby's photo here. And then uh, when you do a 3D printing, just you can predict how the baby will look like. This baby is going to look like this. So you can, and that's how, uh, hopefully that's how it looks like. So here is the 3D printing of a baby also uh, showing how the, uh, you can predict how the baby is going to look at uh, when uh, at birth. So this is uh, the, the last thing I want to show, and hopefully I'm not taking too much of your time is to go into um, what we call uh, the uh, lung ultrasound. I've been there for a long time, but now we are getting more and more familiar with this. Basically, we again had the same uh, concept, a misconception as we had with the, with the pulmonary valve that you cannot find the pulmonary valve. Somebody says you cannot echo the lung. Lung will, of course, lung will block all ultrasound waves. Nothing will, uh, you can't will block the lung up. But we know that uh, <clears throat> it does though. For example, normal lung, you will get these artifacts. These are uh, arc-like artifacts. They are called A-lines, which are normal. But once you have fluid in the lungs, like you have with pulmonary edema or pneumonitis, then they, it changes because now there's a little bit of water there. When there's a water there, 
uh, the reflection, the artifacts change completely. Instead of getting these arc line, arc like uh, lines, you are getting vertical lines. I wish I could show a movie here, vertical lines, which you can see moving. And once you see this, you start thinking that there is something wrong with the lungs. And many times you have patient with subpulmonary edema, you do not hear any rals and uh, ronchi uh, rals there in the in, uh, basal rals. But you see, they, these patients still have subpulmonary uh, edema, su I mean subclinical edema, subclinical pulmonary edema, sorry, subclinical pulmonary edema. And if they have that, uh, you can diagnose that very well by putting uh, the probe and the base of the lungs, in the back or side of the lungs here. And if you see these B lines, and you know that the patient does not have any other, uh, this is a cardiac patient, does not have any actually uh, pneumonia and other, other things, other lung problems, uh, then you know it's pulmonary edema. Not only that, uh, pulmonary edema, as you know, is bilateral. And if the lung pathology, it may not be bilateral, maybe unilateral. So you will see this actually on both sides. You'll see that in the base of the lungs, uh, right lung, to the base of the left lung. And when you see this, uh, and you may start thinking in terms of sub um, clinical, sub acute, Palmedema in the, some of these patients. So that is another big advance which has come up in uh, echocardiography. It's not really echo, it's still lung ultrasound. It's very close to the heart, and you can use the same probe which you use for echocardiogram to look at the lung ultrasound. I think I've taken a lot of your time here. It's, uh, um, it's all, we start about 10 15, and so one hour, 11 15. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir, for your brilliant presentation. I think uh, we all have enjoyed the rapid and rampant advancement in the field of modern echocardiography. By, uh, and uh, this deliberation has been from the father of echocardiography. So this was a very good uh, uh, scope for us to hear this. Uh, I think now we can have some questions to uh, Professor N. C. Nanda, and uh, this session will be uh, moderated by Dr. Mohammadullah. Close by. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, thank you, Professor Navin C. Nanda. Uh, it was a really brilliant lecture, and every time we listen to you, we became amazed with your lectures. Uh, I think there is no question in the question box, so. May I ask our panelists, uh, have you got any question or any comment regarding this? Anyone can ask any question? I'm actually very much interested as an interventional cardiologist. The concept of uh, that dissolution of that microthrombi that in the microcirculation, uh, that's the bane of our uh, interventional cardiologist. Because you open up the artery, you see the blood flow, but the cardiac function is not regained because of the microampullae has blocked the microcirculation the, and the damaged muscles are not getting the blood supply, though the epicardial flow is quite well. And this concept, uh, what modification we have to do for, uh, to the probe? Okay. Hello. Sir, no Vincent on the cell. Yeah, I think that's a very good, a very good comment. What question you had? I didn't get the exact question you wanted to uh, ask me. For the uh, dissolution of the microthrombi in an MI patient after opening up the epicardial artery, what modification you have to do to the probe? The, uh, oh, the, the probe, probe uh, they have to be uh, the faster pulses. Pulses have to be very fast. The pulse which are which are emanating from the probe have to, I think they may, may have something here. I can show you here. For example, if you look at the slide still, over 50% of the patients after successful. Uh, so you have actually, uh, you know, you, um, let me go here and uh, it'll show you here. Uh, these are actually the slide from there. I think that what they've done is, uh, here it is, the short duration of high mechanical index, How that's how they do it. They go for high mechanical index, uh, which is the same as a regular inde mechanical index. You go for very short duration of the pulses. Uh, so because the longer pulse duration, the longer pulse duration, not for diagnosis, because it can result in coronary vascular damage uh, and endothelial disruption. So, they, so what you go is for very short duration pulses. So that's what they found. 
So if you go for now, there is a there was a paper um, many a few years ago from Japan. They put a transducer for a long time on a patient with the coronary disease for I think eighteen hours, twelve hours, many many hours, and showed that the uh, thrombi in the coronary arteries became smaller. But so that that that's not very practical for so many hours. So here is what they've done: is they've gone for uh, very short uh, uh, duration, uh, duration which is less than five microseconds, like here you can see it, and the duration is only about median f- one to point eight minutes. So it's only for a few minutes. You keep it for four or five minutes with short duration, and you can see the improvement in the in the microcirculation. Of course, you won't need it if you do a PTCA and the in fifty percent of the patients, the, everything is cleared up, blood flow is normal. You don't need it. Uh, but uh, if you if you see that the in uh, rest of the fifty percent of the patients the blood flow is not normalized, then you can go for this, or you can do it every in any case just in just to be sure. Okay, so the short duration pulse. That's answer to your question. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, one question from Dr. Deepal Kumar Odhikari: What are the eco parameters you are using now? For determining the indications of CRT. Oh, C- CRT. I think, as you know, long time ago it was shown that uh, you. I mean, echo is not that useful to um, uh, you know to uh, uh, to take the patients on the basis of echo alone for CRT. So that has been shown a while ago, and now I think people are coming back and saying that echo might still be useful. For example, but we still use the other criteria, what the guidelines, like the left bundle branch block. You have, uh, you have a good left bundle branch block. And then, again, you have uh, uh, low ejection fraction, less than 35%. And, of course, the echo can add to that. But what's more important is later on, uh, afterwards, to check and see how effective the CRT has been. That's why we have used echo quite a lot. So CRT is most used afterwards. But, again, you can see this desynchrony. So once now 3D echo has come on the scene, and we are using more and more 3D echo, and you can get automatic actually delays uh, between different walls. That might actually help in uh, telling which patient may benefit from CRT. Also, during when they, uh, you know, as you know, when they place the uh, CRT catheter exactly where you place it, where you get the maximum benefit. Again, that people have done that in the cath lab using echo to see where you have the least amount of dyssynchrony. Uh, and which place is the best, where do you place your, where do you position your catheter best. But again, it's very technically very, not very easy. Sometimes you can't place it the way, the, at the place that you think would have the least dissent. But in other words, we use it more during and after CRT rather than using it as an indication for CRT. But still, echo is useful because you need to get calculated ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is not low, then you don't need, the patient would not most likely need CRT or CRT would not be beneficial. Does that answer the question? Thank you, sir. Can I ask yes, a sir. question to uh, yes, Nanda? Sir, sir. Sir, what is, machine, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, what is the current status of mobile application-based point-of-care ultrasound at this moment? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's used uh, very extensively now since uh, many of the non-cardiologists, the intensivists have learned uh, to use it to some extent, so it is uh, it is actually very 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 much used in the intensive care units. For example, for COVID patients, it's the preferred modality. It's easy to sterilize very quickly. You can do it, you know, and you can actually keep your. I mean, like in some of the countries, uh, some of the institution, you can keep that machine dedicated for COVID patients in in that in that ward or in that ICU. So it is very very useful for acute situation now. Uh, of course, one thing you have to remember that uh, it depends a lot on the training of the person who is using the POCUS. That's important. If he's not very well trained, he can make mistakes. And also, it is not as powerful as other other regular machines, but it is very useful for quick quick answers. If patient is dyspneic, you do it. You want to make sure there's no pericardial effusion, no pericardial effusion. You check quickly. There is a normal function or non-normal function. So that helps you very much in clinically managing the patient. So it's very much extensively used now, focus. Okay. In this you, election, sir. is there any application of tele-echocardiography? Which echocardiography? Tele-echocardiography. Tele-echocardiography, I, I, I don't know very much experience with that, but I think that's, that's something which is more of the telemetry we are doing with the, 
with the COVID, you, instead of seeing the patients, you are seeing them on telemetry. So teleechocardiography, but I don't know how easy, I mean, you can, uh, what you can do is uh, you can actually see someone doing an echocardiogram very easily and direct the patient what to do. You can interpret an echocardiogram, but I'm not sure you can do an echocardiogram remotely on a patient, do an echocardiogram remotely. Thank you, sir. Is there any similarity okay, between... Ask, can I ask yes. some question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, Professor Twinhart, madam. Please. Good morning, uh, Professor Nanda. I'm really ha uh, happy to see you after a long time, and I'm always here to learn something from you. Uh, my question is uh, regarding point of care ultrasound. Is the continuous of wave Doppler is incorporated within the uh, within the point of care ultrasound? So we yeah, can. Well yeah, mostly it has got actually most of the time it has it has got color Doppler, it has got pulse Doppler, but most of the applications don't have continuous uh, Doppler ultrasound. I don't know whether I don't think the I'm not hundred percent sure butterfly one. I also I don't think has, has a continuous uh, Doppler. So that is of course a limitation. So there are some limitations to the uh, to the uh, point of care ultrasound. Now, if you go for a little larger machines uh, like you know. Um, uh, not not very small, which you can carry in your pocket, but with larger machines, they are better. So uh, so they are a little bit better. They are, the size of the laptops a little bit bigger. They are a little bit better. But again, this is again uh, so many companies uh, claim so many things. Uh, but to me, I think the the best one I think I look at, which is the cheap or cheapest, and uh, you can do other things, is the butterfly one. But I don't remember exactly. I don't think it has got the continuous wave ultrasound. But I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah. Another question that um, I know that the dyssynchrony um, parameters are not are no longer recommended for yeah. to predict the outcome of CRT, but the recent literature they show that while doing the uh, strain echocardiography, especially 3D strain echocardiography, the mechanical dispersion helps a little to predict the outcome. So, is there? Uh, do you recommend the mechanical dispersion, or is there any software within the 3D spectral echocardiography that can help to cal calculate the mechanical dispersion easily? Yeah, I, oh, it does. It, actually, 3D echo does it very well. I mean, I don't know whether the one of my slides that showed it already. I think it does it very well. 3D dyssynchrony is done very well. But whether uh, we don't have much data right now that uh, you can use it, I, I, I've got a feeling it, it should be very able to use it, but it hasn't been validated that you can use it to, um, you know, as an indication to take the patient for CRT. Right now, we use echo mainly to look at the ejection fraction. I mean, if there's a left bundle branch block, ejection fraction has to be less than 30, 35%. Then only you take the patient for CRT. Otherwise, you don't take them for CRT. So that's what, but I don't know. Um, if you ask me, my opinion is that 3D echo would be as good as anything else because it shows you, uh, it gives you the actually how much the mechanical dispersion is there. Uh, it can tell you which uh, segments are not doing well, which uh, which have delays, which how much delay there is. It can do a very good job of it, but I don't think of any any research or any paper saying that uh, uh, this can be has been validated and there, it's not in the guidelines. You know, that's the thing. Another thing that uh, in your last lecture you showed the importance of the projected aortic valve area for the in case of low flow, low grade aortic stenosis. Right. So. Uh -huh. I, I sometimes feel uh, difficult to calculate the projected valve area. So uh, we have to increase the flow rate up to 250 milliliter per second for this purpose. So do you have any tips that we can uh, uh, pro calculate the projected AVA um, uh, easier, uh, simply? Yeah, there, there is actually, there is a formula you can use, but uh, most of the time uh, is formula you can use is simply, you, go to, to, you simply, I mean, I don't have the graph to show, but simply prolong the line uh, to uh, to the to the level of 250 cc's or, or 250 mils, and then see what the aortic valve area. But my also question is that the aortic valve area is uh, not very reliable because, especially if the LV outflow tract is on the small side, like two centimeter inner diameter of the LV outflow tract is two centimeters or less, then the calculation of the aortic valve area is very very erroneous. So many times, actually. Now, I'm not talking about low cardiac output, low flow uh, aortic valve stenosis, but in regular stenosis, I depend more on the mean gradient and then on the aortic valve area. 
because I think the aortic valve video is not very reliable, really not very reliable. We have, I think we look at our book from JP Brothers on uh, cases, we have shown some cases where the aortic valve area is, uh, comes up with severe aortic stenosis when there is no, hardly any aortic stenosis. So, but uh, there is a lot of debate about this because, and we are, uh, and most people don't want to stay away from aortic valve area because the whole literature, the whole, uh, everything in the literature depends on aortic valve area, right? If you look at the guidelines and everything, aortic valve is the most important thing, but aortic valve area is very unreliable, especially if the outflow tract is two centimeter or low, less. Yes. We have shown it and other people have shown it. And, and exactly where you measure the outflow tract, uh, how you measure it becomes so so difficult and important. And uh, so the aortic valve is, is a problem. But suppose now when you go into low flow aortic valve stenosis, I think um, you really are basically trying to establish whether the patient has got, uh, what is the, um, uh, whether he has got contractile power or not, right? That's what it is, yes, no? Okay, basically, yes, that's what yes. you want to show. So, so that again, I think um, one can, um, one can actually, so that's that's important that you give dobutamine and everything. And uh, what they've shown is if, of course, if there is a contractile power, the muscle will start to contract. So, you know, there's adequate contractile power. But in some patients where the muscle doesn't seem to contract, that's where you go with the flow rate, right? Before, previously, we never used to go with the flow rate. Now we are going with the flow rate. So that's where you go with the flow rate. And the flow rate, it's, uh, you can ex uh, take two points and then extrapolate it to uh, whatever, 250 mils or 300 mils, then you can calculate the aortic valve area. And that way you can get an idea. Uh, you can get an idea whether the, the contractility is there or not and whether the aortic valve stress or not. Now that is not fully validated according to me. It's a very good concept, uh, very good. Uh, Dr. Roxy Senior, I think is the one who proposed it many years ago. It's a good con concept, but it's not fully validated yet, I think. Okay. But I will definitely make a point for not do not depend on aortic valve area by continued education alone. We, uh, you know, in I mean, I'm not talking about um, generally aortic stenosis where the function is normal. They go for the gradient, according to me. Thank you, sir. May I ask a question to sir? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is a very nice session. Uh, actually, we enjoyed a lot. Sir, always uh, show some different uh, slides and different aspects. And today, he has uh, shown us uh, new uh, advances of uh, cardiac ultrasound. And to be honest, some of uh, our beyond imagination, we are really happy to see this. Sir, I want to uh, uh, I want to draw your attention on a simple issue regarding the patient position during echocardiography. Usually, we used to keep our patient in left lateral position, uh, 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 and uh, you have mentioned that some advantage in right lateral position. And uh, uh, I think you, uh, you some uh, some advanced country or Western country they used to do in right lateral position, but in our uh, country we used to do uh, in a patient keeping left lateral position. Sir, uh, your comment, please, sir, regarding this issue. Oh, sure. Uh, when you do a regular echo, obviously you're going to do that in the, most of the time we do it in left lateral position, sometimes flat on the, wherever we get the good windows, right? But if you, once you finish that examination and you want to get some more information, for example, you want to look at the aorta in more detail, or you want to look at the SVC, or maybe in an adult patient, you think that patient, whether he has an ASD and whether it's a sinusonosa the ASD, at that point, at that point, then you place the, you then move the patient into the right lateral decubitus, completely right lateral decubitus, right, right decubitus. And then once you move in the right lateral decubitus, you place the probe very close to the sternum from second to fourth into space. If you do that, you will be able to, maybe able to get this structure, not in every patient, about 60, 70% of the patient, you'll be able to get the structure that I showed you. So you don't do the examination in that position. No, you do the regular exam. And then you said, now, if I'm not interested in the aorta, I'm not interested in the SVC, I may not want to do it. If you have aortic stenosis, you will not do it. Because the aortic stenosis, some people find that if you do it in the, uh, if you do it from the right personal approach, uh, you may be able to get a higher gradient, which you may miss sometimes from the left side. So in these three, four instances, I will do the right personal examination. Not, but as a matter of thing, every day, for example, if I'm, if I'm personally doing 10, 15 echoes a day, I would at least once or twice, even if it's not indicated, <clears throat> I will also do the examination from the right personal approach just to get a practice. So I don't lose my, my experience, you know? 
if you if you never do it and then you, once you want to do it then you are doing it for the first time you are not going to get results so just to get as a practice once once or twice a day you should examine the patient on the right personal approach just to get an idea you know just to just to get a feel for it and just to be able to get some practice for it you can you should do that once or twice a day okay that's what i meant but you do the examination regular and then if you want to look at certain structures then you do the right personal examination am i clear on that you know yeah. thank you sir uh, one question from uh, dr anisul awal uh sir yeah. tell us about something about rv ejection fraction in our regular practice how can we do it yeah well if you actually the rv ejection fraction <clears throat> if if you don't if the, the 3d is the best but supposing you do not have 3d echocardiography then one of the things i look at is the motion i'm looking at the four chamber view i can see how much the left ventricle is moving right i can see the left ventricular wall moving i look at the right ventricular wall moving and if they are moving in the same practically the same way then i know the rv function is normal correct and if i can compare the two assuming the left ventricular wall motion is normal if the right ventricular wall motion is not moving at all or moving very little and i change position a little bit i make sure and then i can get an idea whether the right ventricular function is low or is normal poor moderate or mild i can get some idea right just by comparing with the left ventricle uh the other way to do that is to look at the you can look at the uh, fractional area change you can planimeterize the the um, you can planimeterize the um, inner wall of the right, right ventricle in the fourth chamber view in and diastole and then systole right and calculate the difference in the area multiply by 100 percentage and if it is 35% or more is normal function if it's less than 35% is abnormal i mean it's 5% 10% very severe so when can be quantitative so that's another way to do it and third way to do that is to look at the tepsi which actually does not give an idea of ejection fraction as i know tepsi is the looking at the annulus motion of the tricuspid valve it is same as looking at the base of the right ventricle moving towards apex right if the annulus which is moving so you're looking at the annulus and of course if the annulus motion on m mode now this m mode echo again we're going back to very old m mode echo if it is uh, 1.6 some people say 1.5 1. Points, around 1.6 or less then it's abnormal but you can have a low tepc and yet a normal ejection fraction you know because the ejection fraction is different than the tepc so i depend not so i mean tepc is good but i depend quite a bit on the rv fractional shortening and my own uh, comparing the walls of the left ventricle with the right ventricle to get an idea of right ventricular function so what i'm Thank tepsi you. is good because tepsi gives you some idea but uh, if i have to choose i will choose uh, a, a fractional shortening and the motion of the right ventricular wall itself free wall thank you sir uh, another question from dr tofail uddin ahmed uh, what is the incremental role of 3d echocardiography in isd in short beg your pardon 3d role of yeah. 3d echocardiography in ischemic heart disease yeah ischemic heart disease actually 3d echocardiography becomes important because if you are calculating the uh, the when you go for regular echo for example you use the biplane simpson you are assuming uh, that there is no wall motion abnormality in there is no localized wall motion abnormality in the ventricle no there is no aneurysm there is no akinetic areas then your biplane simpson works well Re- i mean reasonably well but when you have coronary artery disease if the, there is no wall motion abnormality then you can use biplane simpson no problem at all but if there is wall motion abnormality then i would go for 3d echo because the 2d echo is going to give me erroneous uh, erroneous actually volume of the ventricle or ejection fraction so there i would go for 3d echo but as far as there is an aneurysm wall motion abnormality then 3d echo becomes useful as such uh, 3d echo if you are using artificial intelligence is very good but i mentioned to you is not perfect many times 3d echo will give me a number which i know is cannot be correct you know <laughs> you know so sometimes that happens with 3d echo especially with the poor window the window is good 3d echo works very well if you are going to planimeterize the 3d echo yourself then it's good but that's more time consuming so most of the time i would uh, uh, i would actually uh, go for uh, the good window good window is good i go for 3d echo cardiography window is not very good i would just use uh, my own judgment Uh, to uh, like for example uh, uh, you know visual uh, uh, experience to say what the ejection fraction might be and i got some guidelines 
in that 2D echo. For example, if there's a large dyskinetic area, if there's an aneurysm, I drop the ejection fraction 35% right away. And then I look at other walls. If the other walls are moving normally, I keep it at 35%. If the other walls are moving more, then I'll say 35 to 40. If the other walls are also moving very well, I'll say 30 to 35, like that. Okay. I mean, just to give it Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is, how can we assess diastolic function in atrial fibrillation? Da uh, diastolic function in? Atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, I think most of us believe you cannot do, you cannot really assess it very well. People have looked at, um, for example, people have looked actually at the um, deceleration time and think that that might help, but I, I don't know of any good validation. And I think in the guidelines also, they think that uh, it is not very easy to look at diastolic dysfunction in atrial fibrillation patients. Short answer. You know? Thank you, sir. Uh, at the moment, we have got any question. Uh, Dr. Khalibu Jawan, have you got any uh, comment or uh, question? Can I ask something? Yes, yeah, sure, sir. Uh, in case of atrial fibrillation, uh, when there is subclinical impairment of the systolic function, the GLS, global longitudinal strain, is that helpful or is there varied in different beats? I'm still having a problem in uh, hearing you very well. You're talking about atrial fibrillation. What? And, and the role of uh, global longitudinal strain pattern to detect the subclinical dysfunction, systolic dysfunction. That's, that's, that's only function, right? Systolic, systolic. systolic dysfunction. Astronic? He's asking Sistol. about is, does atrial fibrillation impairs the GLS measurement evaluation? Oh, again, and nothing, nothing much has come from that. As far as I know, nothing uh, where everyone agrees. You know, yeah. Yeah, atrial fibrillation still be, has become a, is, is a still a problem uh, when it comes to systolic function for sure, and GLS also. It is as no one we don't know if any guidelines or anyone who has come with some very big studies, not yet. I, I got a feeling it's going to vary, you know, just like everything else, because atrial fibrillation is a beat to beat variation. So if you're doing the uh, global longitudinal strain, it will vary from beat to beat. So maybe somebody will come with an average, but then even if it comes with an average, it depends on the RR intervals, you know, you know what the RR intervals are. Uh, so there's a lot of vari variability there, I think. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are almost at the end of our session. Um, <laughs> Dr. Firoz, yes, there sir. is another question, you see. Someone uh, there is a... Can I find one question? Someone asking. Pulmonary hypertension measurement. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, pulmonary hypertension measurement, which procedure is the best practice? This is a question. What is the uh, best practice of measuring the pulmonary hypertension? Okay. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to measuring pulmonary hypertension is always looking at the tricuspid regurgitation jet. And, uh, and then again, you, when you see the, go for any view which gives you the best tricuspid regurgitation jet, including the flow acceleration, the PISA. You know, because the PISA tells you where the hole is in the valve, you know, defect in the valve is. So whenever you see the tricuspid regurgitation and then you see a PISA, you know, the flow acceleration on the atrial side going, so that tells you, just like when you see a tub and the water is flowing in a tub, uh, it will accelerate near the hole only. So when you see the pizza, you know that's a hole. So that's where you're going to get your best Doppler. So use color guidance. So put the color Doppler on, find where the pizza is there, whichever view gives the best pizza. Place your continuous Doppler parallel to that pizza if you as parallel as possible, and that will give you the best velocity. Now, once you get the best velocity, then you will have the, um, if you get a very good clear signal, fine. But if the clicking is fuzzy, especially the end of the velocity is a little bit fuzzy, don't take the fuzzy area. So I always tell my uh, fellows, uh, don't go for the beard, go for the chin. See? Don't go yes, for the beard. Sir. The beard is fuzzy. So avoid the fuzzy and then go. If you don't avoid the fuzzy, you'll overestimate the pulmonary pressure. So avoid the fuzzy. So in other words, avoid that one or two millimeters and then place your uh, 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 place your Doppler sample volume and you can get the 
uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, you know, you can get the gradient. And then, of course, you add from the dietary. That's the best way. Uh, all other methods are pulmonary acceleration time, not very reliable, um, no, not very well validated. And sometimes they give you a very rough idea. But here you can get calculate the, the pulmonary artery pressure very close to what you'll get in a cardiac catheterization lab. Especially so beard and chin effect. Beg your pardon? Beard and chin effect. Yeah. Beard and chin effect. Um, Just if you, you have you have uh, um, advice oh, for, to so you're talking the, about the pulmonic regurgitation uh, and also yeah. in uh, tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity. Yeah, peak velocity. Yeah, once you get the peak velocity, you can calculate the systolic pressure. Now, when the question comes up, you di you diagnose pulmonary hypertension not on the basis of peak velocity. You diagnose pulmonary hypertension on the basis of the mean velocity. Mean velocity. How can you get the mean velocity? So one way to think about it is two thirds of the systolic pressure uh, is the mean velocity. But other way, another people think nothing very hundred percent validated. You take the mean PA, mean uh, tracheal regurgitation velocity, and that equals to uh, that after you add the PA after add the RA pressure will come to P uh, uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure. So you should actually give not only calculate the pulmonary artery peak systolic uh, systolic pressure, but also try to calculate the mean of the because that is more important. I mean that's yes, how sir. everyone diagnoses pulmonary hypertension for mean pulmonary artery velocity. Pulmonary. Yeah, not not to be not peak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone and, has and, asked for a question. Uh, he want to know what is high PRF Doppler. Well, high PRF Doppler. I don't think one should use very much high PRF Doppler. What it means is simply it's a it's some it's something like in between pulse Doppler and continuous wave Doppler. Continuous. Yeah, when you when you use a pulse Doppler, you are getting velocity at one one particular point. Continuous wave Doppler gives the velocity all across the line of the continuous wave Doppler. And the high PRF, when you do that, it will give you velocity somewhere in between in that area. So you, you might be able to get a little bit better velocity than aliasing, but best is never to use it. Don't use it. Because you, cannot it's not localize, you cannot localize the site of acceleration, right? Yes. You cannot, cannot localize very well, yeah. Sir, what about the measurement of so, LV? So sometimes it helps because sometimes it helps, for example, if you're looking at an LV, if the left ventricle is hypercontractile and producing gradients, you want to know where exactly the peak gradient is. So if, if the aliasing occurs very quickly, if you use high PRF, uh, you can maybe get some idea that the velocity is high there, but it's not very accurate. So I think it's best not to use it, yeah. Sir, how can we measure the LV EDP, left ventricular and diastolic pressure? Left ventricular and diastolic pressure is same as uh, measuring, you know, that's the diastolic, that's a whole lecture, no? That's to how oh, to sir. measure the <laughs> diastolic. Okay, can you can we quantify, can we quantify the... Yeah, you can well. You can quantify that uh, in 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 some way. Uh, in, uh, well, uh, one of the ways, the best ways to quantify that, if you're very very accurate, you look at the systemic blood pressure. Actually, nowadays there are machines which measure the central blood pressure. So really, you should go for central blood pressure, not not the peripheral blood pressure with the cuff sphygmometer or but the way we use it. Go for the central blood pressure or even the sphygmometer, and then look at the go for mitral regurgitation velocity. That gives you the yes, gradient sir. between the left ventricle and the left atrium, right? Yes, sir. And you know the left yes, ventricle sir. pressure will be same as the central blood pressure or the cuff blood pressure, C so minus, right? From there you can calculate left. But the trouble is you are using very large number to get a very small number. LV and diastolic yes, pressure sir. is 50 and 50, 20, something like that. And blood pressure is like 120, 130. So that, the chance of errors are long. But that's the one that's the best way to measure it if you can do it very, very accurately. But uh, the, the chance of errors are also very high. We've got large number, and so you're getting two large numbers, a small number, right? And the other way is to actually go for the, uh, you have the three out of four criteria to look at the um, and the Doppler. Uh, you look at the uh, E-velocity, uh, lateral, medial. Uh, you look at the um, average of the uh, E to uh, E to E prime ratio, less than 50. And then you look at the tricuspid velocity, should be more than 2.8. And the size of the left atrium, if three of the four are positive, Especially and also if the mitral E wave is uh, much larger than the A wave, like 1.8 or more, if you get three or four of these criteria, in the absence of uh, other things like significant mitral regurgitation, uh, moderate mitral annular calcification, which is not given in guidelines very well, that that produces also annular calcification will increase your E to E prime ratio. 
in the absence of some of these parameters and some wealthy, healthy, young athletes, etc., you uh, you take out those, then you can come up and say that the LV and diastolic pressure is increased. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. This is the short, short way. Uh, thank you, sir, for your brilliant presentation. Can I ask a question? Uh, after Dr. Khalikud Jaman, sir, I am giving you the floor. Dr. Khalikud Jaman, please. We can ever about the modern advances of echocardiography. Previously, we used to know that the echocardiography has got a tremendous field in the diagnostic uh, uh, diagnosis of the cardiovascular diseases. But today, we award that the echocardiography is advancing more in the field of the treatment, particularly today's which you have shown that the, in the treatment of the microvascular obstruction in acute migraine infarction. This is, has got a tremendous role in determining the outcome of the patient suffering from acute migraine infarction. My question to you is that, uh, do you have any plan or research work that is going on to treat the epicardial coronary artery stenosis by echocardiogram by emitting some rays from your probes? Thank you, sir. No, I think uh, you can, you know, if the, if the window is pretty good, I mean, I actually I had a slide there. I had a video, if you remember when I went through, I said coronary arteries were there, you know, but I, I passed it because they are all on video and didn't have the slide on that. I think the coronary arteries, uh, you can see them. Um, as a matter of fact, when I do an echocardiogram on an elder patient, uh, I always try to look at the left main and also try to look at the right coronary artery. And the left main, we can see in many patients, and you can see maybe one centimeter, two centimeter left main. And that's very important to look at epicardial coronary artery in patients. Because if you find a lesion there, you know, you know that patient, of course the T is even better, but you can do on the transthoracic echo, you can look at that. And you can look at the, and you can do a 3D echo, and you may see a little bit more of the, uh, maybe see more of the LED, and more maybe of the circumference, and sometimes we have seen a diagonal branch also. With a T, and sometimes you can once in a while. Now these are not routinely done for sure. These are done in some patients so where you can see very well. In one or two patients, I've also seen a uh, what looks like a thrombus, which is mobile. I know this very vulnerable plaque, very mobile thrombus. You know, thrombus, uh, very thrombus. Also, I've seen. So we have seen this in coronary arteries, and uh, you can use color Doppler and different views to look at. For example, you can go near the tricuspid annulus, and you can try to look at the uh, uh, you know circumflex artery. You can look at the right coronary artery uh, going off. Uh, left coronary artery will come actually at around, uh, let's say, 4 o'clock position. And the right coronary artery will come around 11 o'clock position. So these I routinely do. When I do an, when I look at the aorta, aortic valve, I go a little bit up. So I'm more in the just above the aortic valve. And I always try to look for the left main and the right coronary artery. Now, other people don't look like that, but I try to always look at it. And sometimes I've found coronary artery stenosis. You can look at mid LED quite well, not all of the mid LED, part of the mid LED, by going actually uh, because the coronary artery is on the surface, so you can uh, you can try to make the uh, make the left ventricle disappear. Just like when you go for um, tricuspid inflow view, you go for the tricuspid inflow view. When the left ventricle disappears, that means you are just at the surface of the left ventricle. You can actually see the mid LED very well in many patients. And then sometimes you can look at the um, PDA uh, from some of the apical views. So you can see some coronary arteries, bits, but you don't see the whole coronary artery for sure. But you can see bits and pieces. Out of this, the most important thing, I'll try to look at the mid LED and uh, left main, proximal left main coronary artery, the right coronary artery. So that's what we try to look. I think in the future, when I've, I've since we've got Doppler vibrometry and so many things that are coming up, I think they might be able to get a transducer which will show the surface of the heart very well. And if you can see the surface of the heart very well, or just the uh, surface and a little bit depth of the heart, very uh, proximal depth of the heart, you'll be able to see the coronary arteries also well. Thank you, sir. Professor ABM Abdus Salam. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, okay. uh, Professor Nanda, sir, uh, special greetings to you from Bangladesh, and especially to Madam Konbeawa, special message to greetings to you, Madam, sir. And, Thank you very much. Uh, Really happy to see you again in uh, this pandemic. Uh, you're very good shape, sir. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank so you. Starting from, the, starting from the 3D evaluation of pulmonary valve, we have learned many advanced things from your lecture, at least 16 modalities, uh, uh, starting from the focus, artificial intelligence to measure the volume, measure as 3D, 4D strain. Uh, particularly, it was very am amazing to me that in the 
uh, HD flow imaging uh, for uh, 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 defining the endocardial margin as well as the LV vortex Let's formation uh, for drug So it was wonderful to me actually uh, regarding this uh, acoustic pulse thrombolysis, coronary microthrombolysis, and uh, many things I learned from your lecture. Thank you very much, sir. My uh, one question to you that is, you have in, uh, in your start lecture, you have shown the uh, well visualization 3D as well as 2D of uh, RPA in relation with the SBC and aorta. So, can we measure the or quantify the bidirectional glen flow? After the interventricular repair with this uh, specialized. Again, I think I will ask, I, I missed again. Can you quantify the flow? Then I missed again your talk. I mean, sometimes the internet is not that great. So, integration of uh, interventricular repair, that is bidirectional blend shunt, because no. that is the communication between the SVC and the right pulmonary artery. Uh, no. SVC and right pulmonary artery? Yes, the, uh, so probably, probably. the SPC and the um, RPA. So I think with that uh, 3D uh, volume measurement, we can uh, appreciate the uh, or quantify the uh, Glen Shan flow. This is very important after the. Sir, he's, he's talking report. about. Sir, he is talking about visualization of bidirectional Glen Shan and its quantification. Of flow. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think if you are in that if you are in that area, uh, if you are in that area and there's a good window, I think you'll be able to see the shunt. And uh, obviously, if you are if there is a shunt there, and if you are able to get your um, cursor parallel to the flow, you definitely can quantify the shunt. If you're not getting able to get the uh, if your cursor is not going to be parallel to the flow, then obviously you'll be underestimating the size of the shunt. But if it was if the if the if you're parallel to the flow, then just like you're calculating. Uh, you know, uh, stroke volume from LV outflow tract. You can also calculate the shunt. Uh, you can also calculate the flow uh, from any shunt. Yeah, for sure. But you you have to be uh, because many times when they do surgery, they have the fibrosis in that region. You know, fibrosis, and that yeah, yeah. prevents the ultrasonic beam because that's the problem. But if they, there's not much of fibrosis, then uh, one can definitely quantitate that. But the problem is when you operate in that area, you produce fibrosis. That makes it difficult for you to uh, to um, image that area. It's really that your question? Areas, yeah, but if you can find it uh, and uh, you you are practically parallel within thirty degrees of the flow in in any shunt, you can quantitate the shunt. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. yes. But it's not very easy to do it most patients because of the uh, when when they create the shunt, the, there's fibrosis there. Same thing with the right parasol approach. Uh, if they've operated on that patient in that area, then yeah. the, the, there'll be no window, you know, yeah, because of fibrosis. Thank you, sir. Still safe, sir. Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah, yeah, sure. Dr. Ajay Datta. Ajay Datta, please. Uh, thank you, Nanda, sir, for your brilliant presentation. Actually, we are amazed your uh, modern uh, advancement in echocardiography. I have a specific question. Is there any role of echocardiography or ultrasound for the tissue characterization like edema detection or fibrosis or whether we can differentiate from fibrous tissue from the healthy tissue uh, in where place cardiac MR is very much advancing? Uh, I want to just know what is the advancement in, in uh, ultrasound in that area? Yeah, there is actually, I should have shown a slide of that. Uh, it's called subtraction technique. Uh, you can use that. Uh, what you could, what it does is it subtracts the because ultimately whenever there is fibrosis, it's very echogenic. You know, it's very uh, very echogenic. The reflection is very highly refractile. So one can actually do a subtraction technique. There is something like a called subtraction technique. Again, you change the transducer, so you take out all the uh, tissue which is not very echogenic, and what remains is very halogenic, and that correlates with fibrosis. Of course, you'll be careful you're not near the lung. The lung will also do the same thing. You know, the interface between the muscle and the lung will be very echogenic. But if, if in the myocardium you see uh, echogenic structure, you can use subtraction technique and you can get the fibrosis. And there is actually one, um, uh, one article just published in Echocardiography Journal, I think in the last few months. It's a case report from Albany, New York. And uh, they've done a uh, uh, subtraction technique and you're able to see the area of fibrosis, which correlates with what you see on the CMR. But of course, I think CMR is still much better than echocardiography uh, 
but if the window is good and you do the subtraction technique, you can you can do the same thing. Because fibrosis produces reflect reflect of thing. Also, edema does it to some extent. When there's a lot of edema in the in the muscle, it also becomes echogenic. But fibrosis is very very echogenic. It's a degree of echogenicity. You know how echogenic anything is. So the myocardium is not very echogenic. If there's water in the myocardium, like edema, it becomes echogenic. Uh, we were many many years ago, we tried to do that uh, with a very old ultrasound machine. Uh, to look at patients with acute myocardial infarction because they'll have edema, you know, and we try to see if they could be they're echogenic or not, but our machines were not very good at that time. Uh, but then when there's fibrosis, it becomes very echogenic. So you use a subtraction technique and you can quantify it. It's called subtraction echocardiography. I, I hopefully I could have, could have shown you. Actually, I gave a lecture the other day on that, um, the whole lecture on this, uh, looking at... Um, fibrosis uh, and subtraction techniques in echo echocardiography for something somewhere some webinar i gave I think. Mm -hmm. thank you sir thank you uh, i think we are Dr. two Phil hours in the session Dr. Are, yes sir midnight, midnight in alabama so okay uh, yeah, so yeah, we, are, yeah, we, are right. yeah. <laughs> we, we should not before, tax much upon him Yes, sir. we should not tax too much upon him. It's okay, uh, that's fine, that's fine, no problem. Just let uh, talk uh, some senior cardiologist here. Professor Sajal Banerjee is here. Let talk some senior cardiologist yeah. to comment. Thank you, Mangumdar. Yeah. Uh, many, 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 many thanks to Professor Nanda. He is a really academic and icon person. Uh, we always uh, uh, remain e very eager to. Uh, hear from him, and today he has given very, very Im immense uh, pleasure and knowledge to us. Particularly, he has given new light to us regarding uh, vibrometry for microcoronary circulation, elastography of the heart, and uh, lung ultrasonography to detect subclinical pulmonary edema. Besides uh, his uh, uh, exceptional uh, lecture regarding uh, 3D echo, and he has given immense uh, importance upon the longitudinal straining. I must express uh, gratitude and thanks to Professor Nanda. Uh, indeed, his uh, very presence in our lecture today is a real um, uh, a big achievement on our part, and I must again uh, express deep gratitude and thanks to him and also to madam thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much thanks a lot thank you thank you thank you Dr. Majumdar thank also you, Professor Majumdar, all of you thank you so much appreciate very much okay 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 uh, good night uh, for uh, and good morning uh, for you <laughs> just just one 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 minute for me uh, may, may i conclude now dr okay. firoz dr firoz yes sir you can conclude sir and anyone, anyone is like to make comments, short comments. And any senior teacher is here? No. Uh, probably no, sir. Probably okay, no. thank you. You can conclude, thank sir. You. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, make a conclusion at the midnight of Alabama. Uh, I, I, I actually I have no words to express my gratitude to Professor Ensinonda that he agrees to link with our session, and we are very much privileged and honored to have him in this session. And, and I hope that in the future, he will give us some time again to have some, um, this sort of webinar session. He will be linked up uh, with us. And with these words, and with uh, thank you very much for the uh, audience, for the participating. At the sir, tomorrow's next Friday session, sir. Next uh, Friday. We will we'll discuss it later. Yes, sir. In the next okay. Friday, we'll start at the 10 o'clock, 10 to 12 o'clock. And with these few words, and again, the, my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Ensinonda and my regards to Ms. Uh, Madam, and I conclude this session. Thank you very much, Professor Nanda, and thank you very much, my, of my friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also just make thanks to Mexico Pharma to give us the technical support, particularly Dr. Rajiv is with us. Uh, the Mexico Pharma is giving us the technical support for all this webinar of the eco Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night and goodbye.